Now let's move on to kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy an object has because it is moving. Numerically, the amount of kinetic energy an object possesses depends on two things, namely the object's mass in kilograms and the object's speed in meters per second. The formula for kinetic energy is Ke equals one-half mv squared, and the units for kinetic energy are the same as the units for potential energy, which is to say joules. Now notice something. The kinetic energy scales as the square of the speed. This is a big deal. If you double the speed of an object, its kinetic energy doesn't just double. It increases by a factor of double squared, or by a factor of four. In other words, when you double the speed, the kinetic energy quadruples. If you triple the speed, the kinetic energy increases by a factor of three squared, or by nine. This is a really big deal that the kinetic energy goes up really fast, even if the speed increases only slightly. Practically speaking, if you're in an automobile and you are traveling a little bit faster and then you slam on the brakes, your stopping distance is going to increase by a whole lot. And we'll see that in some upcoming numerical problems. Questions of this nature are going to pop up on the College Board exam in some form. Let's solve another numerical problem. This is example 18.2 from your textbook. A 1500 kilogram car is traveling a wrong road with a speed of 14 meters per second. What kinetic energy does the car possess as a result of its motion? And B, if the speed were reduced to seven meters per second, what's the car's new kinetic energy? There's the kinetic energy formula, and now let's put in the numbers. I wanna put those numbers into my calculator. I get 147,000 joules. So now we go on to part B. Again, the kinetic energy formula is 1 half mv squared. I put in the numbers, and I get a result of 36,750 joules. Just for kicks, if you were to take the ratio of these things, in other words, call the last kinetic energy kinetic energy B, and the first kinetic energy you found, call it kinetic energy A, and take the ratio of those two kinetic energies to each other. In other words, kinetic energy B divided by kinetic energy A. When you put the numbers in, you ought to get, well, let's see what we get. I get 0 0.25. In other words, the final kinetic energy is one-fourth as much as the initial kinetic energy was. And that makes sense. If I cut the speed in half, I reduce the kinetic energy by a fourth. So we are finding that the speed is very important in terms of determining the kinetic energy. Ultimately, what we're going to see is that kinetic energy is going to be useful in the work energy principle, and we'll talk about that in a future lesson. The last part of this lesson has to do with more complicated free body diagrams. And so I want to take a look at these several examples and kind of talk through them a bit. Example 18.3, a box is resting on a rough inclined plane. Sketch a free body diagram that indicates all the forces acting on the box. Label each force. So here is what the diagram looks like in your textbook. There's the plane, and there's the box that's sitting on this rough inclined plane. Now, we want to indicate all the forces. I claim that there are three forces that are acting on this box. The box is not accelerating, it's on a rough plane, and we're making the assumption that it's just sitting there. The earth pulls the box downward. We call that the weight. That is a vector that goes straight to the center of the earth. If the plane is inclined with respect to the surface of the earth, then the weight force is not going to be something that is perpendicular to the surface of the plane. It actually goes down to the center of the earth. Some of you may be able to spot that we're going to have to do something to that vector if we're going to talk about the motion of the box along the plane because that vector is not parallel to the surface of the plane, yet the motion of the object is going to be parallel to the surface, and we'll have to break that vector into components. All right, another force. The plane pushes the box upward. Now, if that plane is angled, then the force that it exerts is also going to be angled. The force, the normal force, is going to be exerted in a direction that's perpendicular to the plane. And so the normal force is going to look something like this. That force is perpendicular to the plane. It's exerted by the plane, the surface, and the direction of that force is perpendicular to the plane. 
Finally, we have the frictional force. Now, which way does the frictional force act? Well, if there were no frictional force at all, if the plane were completely smooth, the box would slide down the plane. So the frictional force must act in a direction that opposes that tendency, which means the frictional force has got to act up the plane. And we're calling that a static frictional force because if the box is resting on the plane, then there's no motion. If the box experiences no velocity changes, then we say the box is in equilibrium, and those three forces are vector forces that would add up to be equal to zero. Now here's a preview of coming attractions. If I want to talk about the motion of this box and the forces that are involved, or if I want to make any calculations, say, about what the coefficient of sliding friction is, then I'm going to have to do something to that weight force. And the way we're going to do it is to, to choose a coordinate system that allows me to resolve the forces into directions parallel and perpendicular to things in the coordinate system. Depending on what the kind of problem is, we may choose a coordinate system that is angled with respect to the ground, and that's what we'll do in this particular case here. So here's what that coordinate system would look like. What I've done is I've drawn a coordinate system in which the x-axis, or the parallel axis, that's what that parentheses with the parallel bars means, is parallel to the surface of the incline, and the y-axis, or the perpendicular axis, is perpendicular to the incline. Now, if my incline makes an angle theta with respect to the ground, then what angle is theta in my diagram? You might be able to say, well, this is easy to spot because it, it's an acute angle, and it's real easy for me to tell. And that's true in this particular diagram, but in other diagrams, it may not be so easy. So let me show you a trick that I use to figure out which angle is what. I'm going to look for lines that are perpendicular to each other. So if I look in my diagram, I'm going to see that the base of the plane, the part that's parallel to the ground, is a vector that is perpendicular to the weight force. So I'll put a one single crosshatch on those two. Those two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Likewise, the incline itself is perpendicular to one of those coordinate axes that I just sketched. In other words, that part of the incline with the two crosshatches is perpendicular to the y-axis there, this y-perpendicular axis. So now what I say is if the angle between the one crosshatch and the two crosshatch is the angle theta, then anywhere that those two lines come together somewhere else on the diagram is also going to represent the angle theta, which turns out to be that right there. Let me make that theta sign a little bit clearer. And now if I wanted to, when it comes time to doing analysis on this problem, then what I would do is to resolve the weight force into a part that is parallel to the plane and a part that's perpendicular, like this. So now I take my weight force and I resolve it into two parts. You can see that I've got myself a right triangle, and one part of that triangle is the adjacent side, which is related to the cosine. That's the part that's in the perpendicular axis. There's another part that's related to the sine, which is the parallel part. And now I can get rid of the weight vector, and I have myself forces that are either parallel or perpendicular to that particular axis. And we'll see that I can write Newton's second law and do all sorts of calculations based on that. Let's go to the next example. The next example says I've got a puck tied to a rope, and the puck is swung in a horizontal circle around a fixed point on a frictionless table. We want to draw a side view parallel to the tabletop free body diagram indicating all the forces acting on the puck. In these sorts of problems, I often find it helpful to make a top view and a side view, a bird's eye view, so to speak. So what's going on here? Imagine I've got an air hockey table that's got a hole cut in it, and I've got a rope that's stringing attached to a puck and the puck is going around and around on the surface of the air hockey table in a circular path around this hole that's cut in the table. So there's the puck, and it's going around and around and around this circle like that. The side view is going to be a snapshot of the puck when it is in a position where I can look at all the forces. So here's the tabletop. Let me sketch my table again. 
Now here's my hole. I've got this puck that is on this string. So imagine here is my puck and it's attached to a string and this string passes through this hole in the table. And the puck is sometimes in this position but it's sometimes on the other side of the table as well. It's going around and around in a circular path, sometimes going away from me, sometimes coming towards me. And I want to focus on the puck when it is on the right-hand side. So let's think about what forces are acting. The earth is pulling the puck downward. So I'm going to call that the weight force. The table is pushing the puck upward. Since it's a table, a horizontal surface, and it's exerting a vertical force, then we're going to call that the normal force because that force is perpendicular to the surface that's exerting it. But now there's something else that's attached to the puck. It's the string. And if the string weren't there, what I claim is that the puck would travel in a path that would be tangent to this curve there. In other words, the string is what's keeping the puck in the circular path. And so it's exerting a force that is toward the center of the circle. And that string force is the centripetal force that keeps that puck in that circular path. And I've indicated that force with F with a subscript string because the string is pulling the puck. Let's go to another example. The next example, 185 a car travels at 60 kilometers per hour around a curved banked track. The curve is designed to handle a speed of 60 kilometers per hour without friction. Draw a free body diagram of all forces acting on the car and label each force. The way this problem is stated is a little bit esoteric and so what I thought to do is to try to put you in touch with kind of a diagram of this and I pulled up here a diagram that shows a car that's on a curve that is slanted. In other words, it's not completely horizontal. It is slanted with respect to the ground. So the, you're looking at the front end of the car. In fact, they've actually got the free body diagram there sketched for you. But let's think about what that looks like. There's the incline. But you can imagine that I've got a roadway that is slanted and I've got an automobile that's traveling on that roadway. And that's what your authors are trying to show you on page 135 of your textbook. That dot represents the center of gravity of the car. The car is traveling at a speed so that it's being pushed a little bit by the roadway towards the center of the circle. The center of the circle is over here and there's part of the roadway which is pushing the car towards the center of the circle. The earth is push, pulling the car downward. That's the weight. That's easy to draw. And now the roadway itself is exerting a force upward on the car in a direction perpendicular to the roadway itself. That's a normal force. And if the car is traveling at just the right speed, and we'll learn how to calculate what that right speed is, it's going to be related to the angle of the track and also what the radius of curvature of the curve is, then there will not be any frictional force that holds the car, keeps the car from slipping up or slipping down the incline. Certainly friction is going to be acting on the car, but not in a direction parallel to the incline itself. There's the diagram that we're looking for. Here's another example. 18.6. A volleyball player serves an ace. At the point that the ball crosses the net, the serve has a horizontal velocity of 15 meters per second and a vertical velocity of negative one meter per second. Here's a hint. Those are red herrings. The velocity is not related to the acceleration, and the acceleration has to do with the unbalanced force. Draw a free body diagram of the forces acting on the ball as it crosses the net. Ignore air resistance and label each force. Well, here's the volleyball. The volleyball is suspended in the air. Certainly it's crossing the net, but what happens to its speed is unrelated to what forces are acting on it. Or at least in a free body diagram, you don't indicate those things. 
So I think what this problem is trying to get you to do is that they're giving you a lot of information that really don't pertain to this particular issue. You want to sketch the forces. What forces act on the ball? Well, if the ball is in the air and there's no air resistance, then the only force that's acting while the ball is in flight, now not the force that got it started, not the force that stops it, not the force if it hits the wall, but the force while it is in the air is just its weight, which is that force right there. All right, it's supposed to be vertical. My arrow doesn't look exactly vertical, but that's it. So we've looked at energy, gravitational potential energy, and kinetic energy. We've looked at free body diagrams, some more complicated ones, and that's what this lesson is about.